Okay, um, welcome everybody. So today we are very happy to have uh, Junior Yagi, and he will tell us about Wilson top lines as from transfer metrics. Uh, please, Junior. Okay, thank you. Thank you for inviting me to present my work here. So this is based on my joint work with Kazunobu Mariyoshi and uh, Toshihiro Ota. The paper was out in last year, September, I think. So, um, so what I'm going to talk about. So in the past 10 years or so, um, there has been uh, various connections discovered between supersymmetric quantum field theories and, the, uh, and quantum integrable systems, right? So I list here uh, four such examples, which are relevant for my talk, sorry. Okay, the first one is uh, probably uh, the most famous one, the beta gauge correspondence, right? And there are two versions, either 2D1 or 4D1. Uh, how do I get a point actually? Uh, yeah, all right. So, uh, and as you know, this uh, was discovered by Nekrasov and Shachvili, right? And the second one, all right, let, let me go uh, over one by one. The second one is, uh, is this one as well. There's an integrable lattice model, two-dimensional integrable lattice model known as Bajan of Sergei model. I don't think your point. Oh, okay, yeah, we do. Oh, oh, yeah, yeah, uh, I, I wasn't using it, all right? So, so this is an integrable lattice model. It's a very interesting model because uh, it's known that by taking some limits of this model, you can get lots of different models, known integrable lattice models. And uh, actually this model arises from four dimensional N equals one supersymmetric quiver gauge theories, where quiver is um, a placed on a plane and nodes are um, are, are, are correspond to vertices and those nodes are jo well, joined by edges of the quiver and you get a lattice made by quiver. By the way, so this is the second instance. The third instance, which was actually a, a more or less direct inspiration for the present work, which I found with Mariyoshi, is that the, the surface defects as transfer matrices. So uh, by this, I mean the following. So you consider the same kind of quiver gauge theory as this one, but here in this kind of theory, you can introduce a surface defect and you compute uh, what this surface defect does to the, the super conformal index of this theory. Then you realize that the surface defects acts as transfer matrices, commuting transfer matrices, sh shifting uh, flavor fiasses. Which are parameters. Are just, uh, three bullet points, they're all uh, in the same sense and integrability in a supersymmetric uh, kind of vacuum sector of the theory, right? Right, so I consider some um, SUSY theories, consider BPS sector, and then you find the integral models, quantum integrable systems. So in a sense, it's all kind of the same type of beasts, not really that different. No, because they are all actually related. The, the fourth one is more recent, all right? So that's a uh, Fortitian science theory discovered by Costello and analyzed by Costello, Yamazaki and Witten. And um, uh, probably you already know that from this Fortitian science theory. So this Fortitian science theory is a 4D analog of ordinary 3D science theory. It's a gauge theory. So uh, it's a gauge theory. So you can construct whistle lines. Right, you take this Fortitian science theory, place it on, on a torus times a say a complex plane, and you take some number of whistle lines and uh, let them well, wrap them around one cycle of the torus so that you get a lattice constructed out of whistle lines on the torus. Now you compute the correlation function of that setup. Then you find that you get the partition function of an integrable lattice model, namely. Yeah, a six well rational six vertex model in this case, right? But this is actually well, this Fortitian science theory is uh, bosonic theory. It only has connection gauge connection, but it secretly 
supersymmetric gaze theory is actually uh, six dimensional n equals one comma one supersymmetric Yamius theory with omega deformation. Omega deformation localizes this 60 super Yamius theory to four dimensional purely bosonic theory, which turns out to be this audition sound theory. So this is something I found with in my work with Kevin. But anyway, anyway so there are more uh, examples, but these four are something related to, to the present talk, okay? So now, um, so let me uh, explain in, in a little bit more detail about two of those four, okay? Um, one is the beta gauge correspondence. One way to phrase it is the following, the 40 version of beta gauge correspondence. So it's a, it's, it gives quantization of donaghy witten integral system. So what is that? So you take 40 n equals two theory, gauge theory, and compactify one of the directions so that the theory is defined on R3 times Swan, right? And you, can, you go to Coulomb branch by giving a VEV to uh, a joint scalar at the infinity, right? So, and now because you compactified one of the directions, if you go to the infrared, effectively theory becomes three dimensional, right? And what you get is n equals four uh, supersymmetric sigma model defined on this R3, right? So you get a three dimensional theory, but it's a sigma model. You can describe it as a sigma model. Uh, what is the target of the sigma model? The target M turns out to be the phase space of a classical complex integrable system, right? So it's a, it's a torus vibration over some some affine base. So that's the uh, classic result by Donaghy and Witten. So the, the insight of Nekrasov and Shashvili is that now if you turn on omega deformation, certain deformation, you apply that deformation to this parent 40 theory, okay? Using um, a rotation symmetry of a uh, uh, plane in, sitting inside R, R3. This Omega deformation has a single deformation parameter, which people call usually call epsilon. Then you uh, try to understand what this omega deformation does to the, the, this integrable system. Then you find that this omega deformation actually quantizes the integrable system. And this deformation parameter epsilon is identified with h bar of the quantization. So, um, so this is the uh, what people Call for the necros of really corresponds beta gauge corresponds. So uh, <coughs> a question can I ask uh, uh, because uh, in this system there are instant on corrections which uh, uh, correct uh, the geometry of the target space. Yes. So do they preserve the integrability? Uh, yes, I'm considering a particular um, a BPS second of this theory actually, actually particular. So the target is hyperkeller but I pick a very special complex structure on the, um, yeah, and, and the integrability is, is there for this very particular um, complex structure. And it, it, well, it's exactly preserved by non potality corrections. So the, okay. the instantons don't destroy the classical integrability. That's the claim. Uh, it, it doesn't. Okay. okay. Uh, so that's, the, uh, that's one example. Another example, this is my work with Mariyoshi a while ago, is the following. Um, actually, I explained this a bit already, but you take some n equals 1, 40 n equals 1 theory, gauge theory, quiver gauge theory, constructed by so-called brain tiling, or you can take a, a class SK theory, some, some N equals one generalizations of class S theories. Now you place the theory on S3 times S1, all right? So that if you compute a partition function, you get the index of the theory. Now you, you insert surface defects, particular kinds of surface defects and on so that it wraps an S1 inside S3 and it also wraps this S1. Okay, now uh, what you want to do is you want to compute the index, the partition function with this surface defect present. 
and you realize that such defects changes the partition function. Uh, well, of course, it changes partition function because you, you did something to the theory, but you, you can describe how it changes, how these subset effects change the, the index partition function without subset effects, right? And it turns out that the subset effects act on the index as difference operators, shifting flavor VSDs, which are parameters of the, uh, of the partition function. And these difference operators actually coincide with transfer matrices of some elliptic quantum integrable systems. And in the simplest case, this elliptic quantum integrable system turns out to be elliptic Rusinov Schneider system. All right, so um, basically you get something elliptic because you, you have a torus here. All right, so. Um, uh, and in, in more complicated cases, you get something more generalization of elliptic RS system. So now, um, in my in this new work with Mariyoshi and Ota, we found a new correspondence between server symmetric gauge theories and quantum integrable system, which um, can be summarized with in, in this equation with some top lines is equal to transfer matrices, right? So it's similar to the work with Mariyoshi I, I just explained, but there are some differences, right? So in that work, we considered N equals one theories in 4D. And in this work, we consider N equals two theories and a circular queer theory. So it's a particular classes theory. So I, we consider particular theory, right? So this theory. Now, uh, the second difference is that the geometry is different. I place it on S1 times R3, not S3, okay? Now, uh, in, in the last work, uh, we were dealing with subset defects. In this work, I consider with some top line operator, right? We let, let's call it T. And you can wrap it around S1 here and sitting at the at some point on R3. Okay. Now, what you do want to do is that you you consider the uh, you go to Coulomb branch of Vakia and you want to consider the fifth of this wisdom top line T. Now, what the and um, T it has depends on Coulomb branch parameters, okay? And you can actually quantize this fu well, function of Coulomb branch parameters. And what you get by quantizing the, the value of T with some top line is equal to the transform matrix of uh, some trigonometric, not elliptic, trigonometric quantum integrable system. Okay, so this is a... Yep. So when you say Wilson uh, minus uh, Toft, uh, is it Wilson uh, or Wilson Toft? Yep. Is, which one of them? Uh, I, I'm going to specify which line operator later. Okay, I, I, I'll explain that. All right. Uh, but anyway, yeah. And uh, then the fact you of uh, you're finding this um, integrability related structures inside what what does it actually teach us about or what does it enable us to do well one thing it, what it enables us to do is right so um it's well so depending on the choice of t sometimes you can compute this web of t from in gauge theory but in general it's computation is very very hard okay so, but by establishing this kind of relationship, you can compute the value of T for general kind of wisdom top line. Well, it's not completely general, but a large set of wisdom top lines by computing the transfer matrix. But this equality is that an observation based on just a direct calculation or you can prove that the transfer matrix? Well, well, we establish this by direct calculations for a particular choice of T, but we also give a string theory explanation for that. So, um, and both sides 
have known generalizations and we expect matching extends to the more general class of wisdom top lines and transform matrices. So, well, yeah, so we, so this is, well, you can say that this is a proposal which we verify for a particular set of, well, uh, of the transform matrices and wisdom top lines. But calculations in gauge theory side is very, very difficult. Because in the case of uh, Nikras of Shatashvili, you can prove it's an integrable model just based on quite direct uh, observation, more or less. By definition, you, you can prove it is integrable. So what, yeah. what obstructs us from doing the same here? Um, yeah, well, it's more or less the, the it's just that the calculation of this has um, difficulty due to, well, to take into account non perturbative corrections is difficult in, in this setup. So, well, there have been some progress recent, in recent years, but I don't think complete understanding has been achieved. Yeah, but I was thinking like without actually computing it, just purely based on some al algebra and then you know, some identities. Uh, sorry, uh, computing the, the same this? way as uh, Nikrasov, Shetashvili, uh, they have proof uh, be before even uh, computing it. I, I mean, Nikrasov has done the uh, computation of partition function, you know, for. Like, yeah, but you don't need to know the answer to, to show that it encodes integrable model as far as I understood. They have uh, just algebraic proof of that without uh, direct full fruition. Maybe I'm wrong, I don't know. Is that right? My understanding is the yeah, necklace of just really uh, result is more or less computing this and computing that and then observing that they are the same. That wasn't my understanding. I don't know. Maybe, maybe anyone can uh, confirm or this or not. No. Okay. But anyway, so let, let me let me move on. So this is like a one page summary of our work in case I run out of time. Okay. I have a lot of things uh, I want to explain, but probably I won't have time to explain everything. But so in case I don't have enough time, then this is like uh, take away from, from today's talk, all right? But, yeah, but, but yeah. sorry, just a question to understand the statement. So the, mm -hmm. uh, the web of the Wilson top loop mm -hmm. is the transfer mm -hmm. matrix in the ground state? No, just a second. Well, well, actually the, the web of uh, Wilson top line is, is a, a function on the phase space which you can quantize to, um, to uh, an operator. And that okay. operator turns out to be the transform matrix acting on the Hilbert space of certain trigonometric quantum integral system. Okay, I see, thanks. All right, so but what we are going to, I, 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 if I have time, I'll explain how uh, this correspondence appears from um, string theory, okay? And using geologies, you can relate this to other known correspondences. So if I have time, I'll like, explain that, right? So um, if you don't have further questions, um, uh, let me move on to the integrable system side of the story, all right? So I'm going to explain what I mean by this transform matrices. So I'll specify which transform matrix of which trigonometric quantum integrable system, okay? And I assume this the audience is uh, know more about quantum well, integrable systems than I do, so uh, I think I can go like fast. Right, right so uh, let me see. Um, so let's consider a periodic spin chain. Okay, so I have a spin site eight, uh, well, uh, one, two, three, up to, well, eight spin sites, right? So 1D periodic spin chain and A1, A2, A3 are spin variables. But I'm going to consider uh, some, some I, I think something people call non-compact spin chains, namely these spin variables are not finite dimensional, 
you know, variables in finite dimensional vector space. So spins are actually valued in the in H dual, where H is the carton of SLN, and it's some integer. You, you it's just a parameter, right? Um, uh, so if you take AR, the spin variable of the R spin side, it's the diagonal matrix, okay? And if you add these numbers, complex numbers, then they you get zero. So that's your, your spin. So spin is uh, is an is is continuous. And um, what is the local Hilbert space carried by each spin side? Well, it's the space of meromorphic functions on HGL. Okay. Oh, why can't I see? Oh, yeah. All right. And because I have n spin sides, the total Hilbert space is just the nth tensor uh, power of the local Hilbert space. Okay. Now, what sorry, I, I, just to clarify, at each side you have n variables, and the Hilbert space at each side is a function of n. I mean, n minus one variables, right? That's what that's right. That's right. Because of the of this constraint, yes. Because it's like your picture, I think, is a bit confusing. So n is not number of uh, sides on the chain. Uh, n it is. Big, it is. Uh, small n is big. N is not big. N specifies. This, uh, the symmetry of the of the spin chain. Okay, thanks. Okay. All right. Um, so in order, to, well, it it turns out to be a little bit more convenient to recast this into the language of lattice model. So let me consider equivalent lattice model. All right. So I place a lattice model on a cylinder. Okay, and I I've drawn a double lines right like in, in the vertical directions and let's well the the way to understand this picture is that you uh want to um think of each spin sides of the spin model spin chain live on the faces sandwiched by double lines okay so so that's a translation between spin chain um Point of view and lattice model point point of view, right? And in the the lattice model side, these spin variables uh, are called dynamical parameters. So that's it's just a different name for the, for the same thing. Okay, so uh, spin variables live on faces of the lattice model. Now, I well in order to define. Uh, this quantum integrable system, I want to define transform matrix, okay? And in the language of lattice model, transform matrix is nothing but a loop operator, okay? So I, I take a loop which goes around in the horizontal direction, okay? And so I, I've drawn a solid line to represent this transform matrix. And you can think of intuitively, you can think of this solid line as the world line of some particle going around. Okay. And in this case, I'm considering the case where this the transform matrix is in the in the vector represent representation of SLM. So this particle has Hilbert space C M. Okay. And so particle state. Um, well, can can change when when it encounters these uh, vertical lines, right? But if you look at this picture, the transfer matrix consists of n copies of what what's called L operator, which is which corresponds to this picture, right? Oh, before that, uh, important thing is each solid line line operator carries a parameter. Z, which is complex parameter, is called a spectral parameter. All right. So I'm considering a line operator, uh, one parameter family of line operator. Now, if you look at the picture, you notice that this transform matrix is just a concatenation of uh, n copies of this L operator, which is which corresponds to this picture. Okay. 
now. Um, so what is this L operator? So L operator, well, uh, a little, little bit more detail can be explained, well, can be drawn like this. So, so as I said, so there's a particle going this direction. No, 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 stai attento a quello che io non... Okay. Uh, and uh, particle, let's say the initial particle state is in the i state. And after encountering this solid line, sorry, double line in vertical direction, its particle state changes to j state, all right? So I put i and j like this, okay? And, um, and also uh, remember that dynamical parameters live on the faces of the lattice, so which I drawn here, a1 and a2. All right, and these are independent dynamical parameters. And so there's a rule which I want to introduce. The value of the dynamical parameter changes, jumps when you cross the solid line, okay? And the amount it changes is some, um, is given by, given by, the, by this formula. If you cross solid line this direction, the dynamical parameter changes by minus epsilon. Epsilon is some parameter I choose times hi, where hi is the weight of the i state in the vector representation. So completely- I'm Sorry, Yunya, I, I must have missed it. What are these a's? So a's are just parameters which are in the in the uh, jaw of the Cartan of SLM, which you which live on the faces of lattice. Okay, so so there are face variables in this lattice model. So in the spin chain, these were just just the Cartans of of the at each side. You mean right? So why have I yeah in the spin chain picture? But how uh, do, you get, do you do you get these values of h1, h2, and so on? Why they appear in this way? Why they appear in this way? Uh, I mean, they, it, it, at this point, it's just a just some rule I I impose to to get interesting lattice model, integrable lattice model. But there are uh, if well. You can motivate this rule from the point of view of Fortean science theory, for example. Uh, in the Fortean science theory, if you place Fortean science theory on torus times elliptic curve, then the actually the um, um, the the kind of lattice model you get is this kind of lattice model. Well, in the in the I, I guess I guess the, the, the so the the connection to the spin chain is sort of lost, right? The, this, the, these things don't appear in the spin chain. These kinds of jumps. Uh, they they actually do. So in, in the okay, spin so chain, what do they look like in a spin chain? Yeah, in the spin chain, I didn't when when I explained spin chain, I didn't include these uh, horizontal lines, right? Um, in the spin chain, well, I had spin sites and spin variables a one and a two and so on. And in the spin chain, I could also introduce transfer matrix, right? Define transfer matrix. And in, in that spin chain, transform matrix acts by difference operators, shifting these variables. Uh, excuse me, but uh, as this, what I explain something to do with uh, uh, auxiliary space and quantum space of the spin chain or, or, or not? So I so, are auxiliary uh, fundamental, but what I'm confused is what is physical. Uh, so before you Yes, said exactly. Was that that was my question, Nicola. Functions yeah. of n minus one variables but now there are all these faces and you like kind of shifted it a bit. So it's not clear. So normally on one side, you, you have some Hilbert space. So this double yeah. line would represent some operator acting on the Hilbert, uh, on the physical Hilbert space of one. Uh, so what is the Hilbert space now? Uh, is this... No, it's a Hilbert space is still the same. Right? So you have Hilbert space, uh, which is a tensor product of Hilbert space living here and living here and, and so on. No, if you fix uh, i and j indices, uh, which are in auxiliary space, then L should be an operator in physical space, right? Yes. Normally. So yes. what type of operator and uh, what does it's it a, have on? 
it's a difference operator acting on, on Hilbert space. Hilbert space is a space of meromorphic functions of these A1, X, and so on. And operators act by shifting those. So Hilbert space now has uh, two N variables, you're saying? Uh, oh, so if you look, just look at this local part of the of the spin chain or lattice model, but uh, I have n sites times times large, um, large n, large n, large n. Okay. So my question is, if you, if you fix i and j auxiliary space indices, L should be an operator acting on physical space. So first question, what is your physical space? And second question, how does it act on the physical space? Uh, the physical, the well, the Hilbert space of the spin chain or lattice. No, not of spin chain. On one side, right? On each side, there is a Hilbert space, and then you take uh, tensor product. So what? Yeah, is, it acts on the point? tensor product of uh, of so this M eight. Um, yeah, but L doesn't act on tensor product normally. L would act on well, one copy. It depends. It depends on how what, how you define L. Well, normally, at least from what I heard, I mean, there are, to define L, there are all to different kinds of one copy of Hilbert space. There, well, in well, in the context of dynamical quantum groups, this is I mean, well, there are all different kinds of things you can you can do here. Uh, excuse me, if A one and A two are adjacent. On the spin chain, then why one has also inside index i and index j? They have to have indices one and two. Sorry, uh, I I didn't understand the question. Here, one. And How two. appears i and j on this picture of L? I and j refers to the element in the auxiliary space, which is n-dimensional complex uh, vector space. Mm -hmm. Yes. And yes. the upper index on A refers to a particular site on the spin chain, or more yes. like a phase. So which yes. runs from one uh, to small n. So they are different indices. Yeah, this I would understand, but I don't understand why these circles have this i and j. I mean, this is uh, uh, these were initially the sites uh, of the spin chain. No, the the, the yeah. sites of the spin chains were were here. A1 and A2 are spin variables spin at spin sides. Okay. In the spin chain picture. Okay. Okay. But I then I moved to a, a lattice model picture. In the lattice model, those spin variables turn well, turn into face variables. Does it make sense? Okay, okay. Okay. Maybe could you draw the, oh, for me the L in the spin exactly. chain picture? I, I think it would clarify if you could draw L in the spin chain picture that we all are familiar yeah, with. Yeah, the spin uh, yeah, spin variables in the spin chain picture. I, I've drawn spin chain like this, right? Uh-huh. Yeah. So it's a bit unusual, at least for me, that the L operator acts on the link of the spin chain rather than on the side. Is it mm -hmm. like a common thing? Or, or at least I, I haven't seen uh, this construction. Well, um, yeah, I think it, uh, it happens in dynamical R matrix case. So, yeah, so, so far, it's, it's, so it's, it's that dynamical thing that we're trying to understand, I guess. How, how does, how, how do you go from a normal spin chain to a dynamical one? Well, in general, well, there's no general way to relate the two, but in certain cases, for example, um, there's something called vertex space correspondence, which relates a, um, some vertex model and our matrix for vertex model and um, our matrix of corresponding phase model by some similarity transformation like this. 
So, or there are some pairs of uh, models which are related this way, but that's that's about it. I mean, when, when, when you consider two-dimensional integral lattice model, you, you can do a lot of different things. You can place um, Right, and so you would recover, is, is it fair to say that you would recover the spin chain, uh, the usual spin chain when you set epsilon to zero? Or am I missing the point? I, it depends on what you mean by usual spin chain. Just the nearest neighbor SLN spin chain. Oh, like XXX kind of thing? Yeah, because I, I think um, that's... Well, this is more like well, non-compact non XXX spin chain where sure. you get the arm module. The non-compact's fine, but the yeah. epsilon... Right, so you, yeah, you, you can get that. You, you, you uh, let me see, uh, uh, do you get... I, I think the epsilon maybe gives you the elliptic, this one makes it trigonometric or elliptic. Is that the role? Of the this? trigonometric one, you, you get, I think you get non compact XXC spin chain from here. Well, well in, in the specific example I'm going to talk about. Yeah. Well, and if I set epsilon to zero, to be very large, but you can restrict it to bar modules. And if I set epsilon to zero? No, you don't have to set epsilon to zero. Epsilon is gonna be a quantization parameter. But what happens when I set epsilon to zero? Now, if I set epsilon to zero, L won't depend on i and j, right? So it will be trivial in uh, right. exterior space. I see. Okay. Mm. All right. Okay, thanks. By the way, how, how much time do I have? Um. It is supposed to be one hour talk. No, we reach uh, total understanding. Yeah, yeah. So all right, great, very good. Usually right. we have the break in about ten minutes, but um, all right. from now or fifteen minutes, if oh, oh, that's and we continue after the break, right? Yeah, yeah, but then we continue. Uh, so uh, I see. All right, and okay. Uh, so the break is after one hour, and then we, it's like we can continue. After four, Forty minutes, the break, and minutes. then um, right. you can have half half an hour more. But let let's see. All right, all right let's we, see. We let's stopped see. you many times, so. <laughs> all right. Okay. So let me try to get to the end of interval system side and and um, have a break probably if if that's possible. All right. So yeah. let's yeah let's let's try let's. Try. Right, but anyway, so this, here's the same picture I just reproduced, right? Um, I should have drawn something. Um, so what is this picture? So this picture defines a matrix element of, of this L operator. So L operator is, uh, is an N by N operator n by n matrix because you know you have two indices i and j which uh, both of which run from one to n okay so this is a matrix element of n by n um, matrix and it depends on the spectral parameter z but it also depends on a1 and a2 okay but you can combine these quantities in, in this way all right where delta one and delta one i and delta two j are difference operators are defined this way. So delta i r acts on the i's uh, dynamical variable at r site. Okay, so uh, a r r so if r is one, so delta one acts on, on this guy and delta one i will shift a1 to a1 minus epsilon h1 like this, okay? So you can take these quantities, which depends on a lot of different things, but you can combine them into a single operator. Okay, and if you do that, what you get is a difference operator acting on, on, on this tensor product of two local Hilbert spaces. Okay, is this clear? 
Uh, well, I mean, I'm still confused. What is L of Z semicolon A comma A? What What is that? Is it a number or what type of object? So this is just, this whole thing is just a number uh, correspond and which I can represent by this picture, okay? But this is just a number. No, if you I look don't at quite understand how you represent a number by this picture, because picture is a transformation, right? Whereas, so it's more like a operator for me, the right hand side. Well, it's, it's, it's like, it's like a, um, so it, so what I have is really in mind is some four-digit science picture actually. So this corresponds to Wilson line, open Wilson line, okay. Mm -hmm. And this corresponds to some other um, another kind of line operator. It's related to a uh, top line actually. And um, you have some um, parameters, value of some fields specifying these values. And you take this setup and you take the VEV, uh, you yeah, compute the value of this setup. But and let's you get say a it's a thin chain description, right? So we have Hilbert space. Uh, it, it is like uh, functions of the says. Uh, then L is a finite difference operator acting on this Hilbert space. So why the the operator itself depends on these variables? In which way then it depends on these variables? Is it I, A and Z? Is it what you're saying? And then what is this? Uh, so, uh, okay, okay. So L of Z. L depends on C, right? So L is an operator which acts on on a, on on some element of this space, which is a function of two variables, a one and a two. Okay, and the action is given by this formula: L Z a one a two J I F a one minus epsilon h uh, i comma a two minus epsilon h j. All right. So uh, this, give me, this, this, give me. Me. this is the fine, but what is L? In, uh, in your formula above on the top line, already these differences a one minus epsilon h i are already included. Now it turns out they are not included in in the cell. Because they, they appear separately as different operators. Uh, yeah, so uh, there it meant that left hand side. Is not correct in you know, this sense. I, sorry, I, I don't quite understand what you. So let's ignore the picture. Uh, let's the agree. Picture, picture is very confusing. Ignore the picture. He wrote some formula. Let's try to understand yeah, the picture. Right. So if you like that, then that's fine. I mean, but formula, is, I still don't understand what is L of Z comma A comma A. What is that? You didn't define for us this. I mean, so dep this depends on, on which integral system you, you choose, but it's just a number coefficient. Well, it's not a number. It's like a function of Z and two other parameters, which are actually a function of. Uh, I mean, if you specify like A1 and A2 and I and J, it's just a number. Yeah, but I mean, it is a function. So can you give some it examples? Is, yes. It is, yes. Is it linear in Z? Because from your picture, it looks like it's linear in Z. Linear in Z, why? Because it's Z, oh, okay, Z is a spectral parameter. It's not multiplied. So it, it is a parameter, uh, parameterizing this line, yeah. So will you give some examples of L, Z? Yeah, A2? I'm going to give you a formula for, uh, uh, for particular integral system, what this L operator is. Right, but so it will be something uh, like theta function, right? Like I see from the paper. Uh, it, yeah, in the elliptic case, yes. But I'm going to take a trigonometric metric limit of that. Yeah. So at the end of the day, it's going to be ratios of trigonometric functions uh, of z and a one and a two. It's just yeah. I'm going to give you a concrete formula for this L operator. Okay. But anyway, so uh, now once you have L operator, so you, you can define transform matrix by just multiplying L oper operators in, in this, uh, I guess you call it auxiliary space. So in the space of, of I and J, right? So you just multiply them. So probably is another confusing thing that I is lower, J is upper. So they should have uh, different covariance to make trace for transfer matrix. But in your delta operations, they are both shifted negatively. 
So should it be like delta one should be a minus hi and delta two be a plus hi? No. Uh, uh, then that, kind that. of I don't so but T then also okay. kind of shifts uh, its own operators that non-trivially acts on A by shifting them. Yes. Yes. Sorry. So what was the statement again? What was the question um, again? It's just uh, it's just uh, what well, well, let's let's just write explicitly T of one side on how it acts. Um, then it will be clear what I'm asking. What well, when T is one side when A one when you identify A one and A two. Yes. I see. Then, in that case, you just get a single um, di difference operator, and L Z and A A, and uh, what well, that's going to be I I. You just get this operator. Happy Dima. Not yet, but okay. <laughs> All right. Mm. Okay, so uh, let uh, I mean uh, let's not go into upper lower indices, but at least let's uh, see some else in the future. Uh, yeah. I mean, it's just all right. So uh, well, uh, I is lower and J is upper because I is in the in the, is the incoming state, and J is the outgoing state. Oh, it's okay. Let's not go into upper lower. This is a bit uh, too detailed. But anyway, so the point is by concatenating L operator. You get a transform matrix, just like you know, trace of R, 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 R. Okay, I'm take I'm considering trace of L times L times L, n copies of L operator, and what you get, what you get is a, a difference operator acting on the total Hilbert space, which is a Hilbert space of the spin chain or integrable lattice model. Okay, so now. Uh, so I, I, no, sorry, I have to yeah. ask this now. I do not understand how you sum out. So you sum over eyes, but um, in form yes. of, uh, um, uh, I, I kind of see three in this three times the same index repeating in the form of a transfer matrix. Yeah, but just draw a picture and follow this ru uh, rule on top, right? So it no, just... but keep picture is confusing, right? Uh, so but because deltas are missing in the left hand side. No, right? but uh, look. Uh, so in a in definition of L, deltas are contracted. Indices are contracted, and then I have both mm -hmm. deltas and. Uh, yes. uh, but in the T definition, it's not just L. It's explicit. All indices are written in definition of T. It seems to make sense. Uh, no, but okay. So I, for instance, like I one, I will appear three times in the formula, uh, explicit one. formula. Uh, yeah, that's so, right. But it's summed over explicitly. So probably some of our uh, some of our I one I appears three times. I mean, have we ever saw uh, saw such things? Multiply um, uh, yeah, the a matrix element by delta i each time that I. I mean, the indices should be contracted, right? So three <laughs> times indexes is, is, is okay. Uh, the, 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 there could be some lack of beauty in indices, but the action I think is clear, right? It acts on the yeah. function variable by shifting depending on the indices and I accelerate. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, why? Why? Uh, yeah. Well, anyway, so I'm. I'm not. But anyway, so it's not like. GR, right? So I'm not talking. There is no metric. It's not like general covariance. You want to, to have contraction of indices by the rules uh, of uh, covariance theory. He, any, an index can appear. Covariant under what? Covariant under. Uh, these are indices which may appear five times if necessary. Five times, I don't. Well, I first time see something which has more than two indices. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, anyway. We can continue in the break. Just, but let's we, we keep the pride in with our uh, selected uh, speakers, you know. <laughs> right, so the idea is all right. So you you do you you know you concatenate right i j k and l and so on. The well, whatever spin variables. Uh, in the internal edge must be summed over. Okay, so that's this this summation. No, I think a rule is clear. To Dima, he just complains that there are uh, triple indices which look a little bit uh, weird. I think uh, Dima, to to help you, you should write square root of delta kind of, uh, and then have two deltas attached to each other. But anyway, so all right, so 
Okay, uh, let, me, let, me, let me move on. Um, so because I introduced uh, this solid line, right? Line operator. So I'm supposing that, so I, back in my mind, I have four digital signs. All right, and this solid line is Wilson line, right? Because I have solid line, I can take two, two solid lines and make a crossing. Then I should get an R matrix, okay? Which I call this um, R, okay? Which corresponds to uh, this picture, two solid lines crossing, uh, spectral parameters, G, Z and Z prime, okay? And initial states I and J becomes final states K and L. So, and, and again, there's this dynamical parameter actually living on each face. But if you remember how dynamical parameters are supposed to change across uh, solid lines, if you specify the value of the dynamical parameter on, e, on, on one face of the picture, the value of the dynamical parameters at the other faces are automatically specified once you specify these states, okay? So therefore, when you write down the R matrix, well, R matrix depends on, on single dynamical parameter. Sorry, but little problem I'm having. So I can reach, uh, say, a lower right quadrant in two ways, and each time- uh... Well, well, there, yeah, there is a condition that, so I, you go this way or that way, you should get the same value. So there, there's a, that's going to be a condition imposed on the R matrix. Okay. But so, um, so, so this is probably a little better than L operator. So R matrix, the matrix element of the R matrix can be represented graphically by this picture. Okay. But then um, you require this R matrix to satisfy Young Box equation. Well, it looks like the family of young box equation, but you have to remember there are phase variables, dynamical parameters, but it's just uh, graphically it's the same. So, and, and this version of young box equation is called dynamical young box equation because our matrix depends on dynamical parameters. Okay. Um, so um, I, I have this guy in, in my, in my uh, theory. And, um, and the final important thing is that I have, I, in my theory, I have L operator and R matrix, and they are supposed to satisfy this RLL relation, which graphically is just this relation. So I have two L operators, single R operator, R matrix on the left-hand side. And similarly, I have an R matrix, L operator, L operator here but they are multiplied in different ways, okay? But physics, it's supposed to be the same. Either you have here this one or this one. Okay, so, uh, so I have L operator R matrix and R matrix satisfies the Young -Bach, dynamical young box equation and L and R sat should satisfy R L L relation. I'm considering this kind of system. But the importance of this R L L relation I think you're from, uh, you, you, you know, I, I don't think I really have to explain this to this audience, is that this relation implies that transform matrices defined by the L operator commute. Okay. Oh, but for that, so, you also need something like R square proportional to identity, no? Uh, R has to be non-degenerate so that you have R inverse. Uh, um, then uh, R inverse, does it also satisfy RLL for you? Uh, okay, you don't care actually. No, well, I, I, well I, just in case I, I have this graphical, the, what, what you call train trick or something, uh, I don't remember, but uh, I don't think R inverse has to satisfy the young box equation. So yeah, so I have, suppose you, you have this picture by repeated use of RLL relation you get to the right hand side. But now I multiply both sides by R inverse, which I graphically represent by, by this opposite, crossing in the opposite way, okay? And then I take the trace of the two sides. And so I have R and R inverse. So this, is, this part is gonna be identity. And by cyclic probability of, of the trace, 
you can cancel this part and that, that part. And at the end of the day, you realize that red line and blue lines are interchanged if you go from the left-hand side to the right-hand side, okay? So this is the usual story. Um, but anyway, so um, we have commuting transform matrices and therefore, and each transform matrix depends on spectral parameter in which you can, in which you can expand. And it shows that you get a, a series of commuting difference, well, commuting operators acting on the Hilbert space. But remember, these transform matrices were are difference operators acting on Hilbert space. Here, Hilbert space is a space of functions of those dynamical parameters. Okay? And therefore, these commuting uh, charges are themselves difference operators. But anyway, so this is the, the usual statement of integrability, okay? But anyway, so I want to specify uh, which quantum integrable system I'm going to talk about. So this is a trigonometric L operator. It's a trigonometric limit of the elliptic L operator discovered uh, in the 90s, I think, by Hasegawa, um, which can be written in this concrete form, okay. So this is just a so this is a formula everyone was looking for. I just use square root of delta. I told you. Yeah, but there are two square root of deltas, okay. Um, so um, if you want, you can just move this to the right by you know letting them act on on, on the whatever function of a is here. But it turns out to be more convenient to have well, express L operator this way. But anyway, so this L operator depends on uh, parameters W, M, and Z is a spectral parameter. W and M are complex numbers. Okay. Um, uh, I shouldn't have I index I and J here. It's just uh, I, I don't need those actually. So it's just an L operator, not the matrix element. But anyway, so um, it appears, well, it's given by this formula. So you have some, some sine function, ratio of sines, and then there's this function Ln, which is given by this formula. Well, it's a little bit complicated, but not too much. Okay, it's just, okay. Why and, is there any dependence on, on W? Can't I, it looks like I can just shift Z and get rid of W. Uh, you, you, can do, you can do that. Um, is it a type or analysis in denominator? It's actually, yeah, so which I explained here. So actually W and M can be thought of as spectral parameters associated to this vertical line, okay? And um, so you realize that only Z minus, M, Z minus W appears here, right? In this formula. So that's, that corresponds to the usual difference property okay. of, the, of the R matrix, you know, depends on the homogeneity the usual case. Is it, yeah, a typo, homogeneity. is it a typo in a, a small L in denominators, uh, the second term, is it A2? No, it's A1 actually. I think it can be either both A2, A2 or A1, A1. I but I understand what does AKI means before A's were diagonal matrices. Oh, sorry. Uh, I didn't explain. AIJ is equal to AI minus AJ. Okay. okay. Anyway, so, um, so double line carries two spectral parameters and, and that's why I denoted them as double lines. But anyway, so this one, L operator, satisfies an RLL relation with a uh, trigonometric dynamical R matrix. So this is a trigonometric limit of the elliptic R dynamical R matrix. The elliptic dynamical R matrix was constructed by Felder in, in the 90s, which defines, uh, which appears in the definition of elliptic quantum group. 
But anyway, so this gives a specific example of L operator and R matrix, uh, which I was talking about in, in more confusing manner. Okay. Um, let me see. Um, well, it's already well. But anyway, um, so let, let, let me uh, try to finish this integrable system side quickly. All right. So because um, L operator has two parameters, W and M, and that's uh, kind of annoying. So I take limits where W goes to either plus inf I infinity or minus I infinity, right? So, um, and call the results L plus minus comma M. So then I get two different versions of L operators, which only carries this parameter M in addition to its, well, uh, yeah. If you take this limit, then the spectral parameter Z drops out. But if you know this L plus M and L minus M, then by taking a certain linear combination, you can recon reconstruct the, the, the full L operator I, I've, I've uh, written down. So without loss of generality, we can also consider as well consider L plus and L minus instead of this full L operator. So let's let's do that. Let's call L plus and L minus fundamental L operators, right? Um, instead of considering the um, the full L operator. Now I have L plus and L minus, and you can start constructing transform matrix matrices out of L plus and L minus. Then to do that, what you do what um, you have n spin sites, right? At, at each spin site, you have to choose L, either L plus or L minus. And you also have to choose this inhomogeneity M. So the transform matrix is specified by an n tuple of signs plus minuses and n tuple of complex numbers M's. Okay. And, and, and you, you define the transform matrix constructed out of L operators specified by sigma signs and M's. Okay. Just to and be absolutely sure. So T's with different choices of plus minuses will not commute in general, right? Uh, they, let me, let me try. Uh, uh, they, they, they do not, no. They don't. But anyway, so um, I get this. The, the, the transform matrix constructed out of these L operators is this guy, okay? So, and this is the, the main character from the integrable system side, right? So I've already used more than one hour. Yeah. Uh, so probably yeah, we should have a break. But and one comment about integrability is that this guy actually corresponds to the vector representation associated to this horizontal solid line, but you can take actually any representation. So uh, just like elliptic, well, just like recent Schneider model, you can consider like a uh, anti-symmetric reps and they mutually commute and you get nice things. But anyway, so um, uh, that's the end of integrable system side. And what I want to do is to explain the gauge theory side of the story and state the correspondence. Uh, shall we have a break or yeah. Yeah, like 10 minutes? Yeah. Oh, yeah, let's break for 10 minutes. All right. Nicole, if you can stop the recording. Please. Okay, so let's move on to the gauge theory side. Okay, hopefully it's uh, less controversial. Uh, so um, I'm going to consider 40 n equals two gauge theories, and they are known to have half BPS with some top lines. So what is this? So it's a word line of very very massive. So therefore, well, not not variable of uh, path integral. It's a very massive dionic particles having both electric charge and magnetic charge. Okay, so I call electric magnetic charge M, electric charge 
E, and they are, um, are elements of, M is an element of the weight lattice of the gauge group. E is the element of the weight lattice of the gauge group, but then there's a, you, you take the quotient by the vial group. So the, the, uh, any pair of uh, dionic charge related by the, by the action of vial group is, or they are identified, okay? But anyway, so special cases when M is zero, when there's no magnetic charge. So that's a pure electric charge. And the, um, uh, it's known to be known as Wilson line, okay? So, and it's labeled by representation of the, the algebra of the gauge group. Uh, on the other hand, when there's no electric charge equals zero, then it's known as top line. And it's labeled by representation of the Langlands dual, the, the group uh, Langlands dual of G. Okay, but in general, Wilson top line can have both M and E non-zero. Um, so one way to construct it is you specify uh, M. So you and you introduce top line and on and top line magnetic charge of the top line breaks gauge symmetry down to subgroup, which leaves this magnetic charge invariant. But using this remnant gauge group, you can introduce Wilson line on top of top line. And what the, the result is this Wilson top line, which carries both magnetic charge and electric charge. Okay. And you can uh, introduce them preserving half of super symmetries. All right, now um, I, go to consider a very, very specific theory, which is a circular quiver theory, which is described by this quiver. So you have N nodes. Each node represents an SUN gauge group. And these uh, gauge groups, these nodes are arranged in a circle, uh, arranged on a circle, and they are connected by edges. These edges, represent by fundamental hypers, okay? For example, if you consider this weight, this weight is a hyper multiplet in the by fundamental representation of SUN here and SUN here. Okay, and each by fundamental hyper um, uh, ca carries a mass parameter. So I have N by fundamental hypers and therefore N mass parameters. These mass parameters are complex numbers. And obviously these, well, as the, the symbol suggests, these are to be identified with M's, those parameters I introduced before. Uh, one way to obtain this circular queer theory is to uh, start from six dimensions. So in 60, so there's this six dimensional n equals two count zero uh, super conformity theory. You can take this theory and compactify it on an n puncture torus. Okay. And uh, depend, well, it depends on what, what kind of theory you get, depends on what kind of punctures you introduce, but for specific choice of punctures, what you get is this theory. So this is not a, just uh, a, also obtained from some orbifold, Z an orbifold of uh, D three brains. Uh, yeah, you can do that as okay. well. Yeah. Um, but from this in, in this sixty language, the Wilson top lines I talked about arise as arise from self defects, co-dimension four defects in sixty theory, right? So co-dimension four defects can wrap any one cycle on this torus, okay? Um, then, uh, because you take two-dimensional defect and wrap it on a one cycle, you are left with one more, one, one dimension left, right? So in, in the 4D, after compactification, you get a line operator, which is this Wilson top line. Okay, and the charge of Wilson top line depends on what one cycle you choose on the torus. Okay. So, so, so locally, these would be just some PQ strings ending on the D3 brains? 
a PQ strings ending. You know, a, a bound state of a fundamental and a D string. Oh, sorry. Uh, it's, it's not P. Uh, PQ strings on. Uh, yeah. Uh, sorry. It depends on the geology frame, but I think in one frame, I think it's a D3 brain. Oh, okay. Uh, okay, uh, anyway, sorry, uh, maybe yeah, I, I left, I'll on, ask my questions later. What, what kind of geology you, you apply to go from M theory to five brains? Okay. All right, so um, now I'm going to consider this specific theory and specific version top line corresponding to the following one cycle on the torus, right, which is defi defined by uh, two, actually two things. This, all right, first of all, the SAFS defects in 60 is labeled by representation of, of this D algebra, which I take to be SUN, but I take it to be fundamental rep. Okay, so that's this box. But this one cycle, to specify the one, this one cycle, you have to specify n tuple of sine sigma, all right? And when sigma r is plus one, then this cycle say go when say r is one right then when sigma one is plus then this cycle goes above this first puncture when sigma is negative it goes down it goes below the corresponding puncture so for for example this picture corresponds to so far it corresponds to sigma one plus one equals plus one when sigma two is plus is minus one then it goes below the second puncture and so on and so forth. Okay. So when you specify these signs, that specifies one cycle, and therefore that specifies Wilson top line in the in this circular quiver theory. It, is, is this clear? Okay. But anyway, so we I consider this uh, particular Wilson top line. But Anyway, so uh, I obtained this way, in this way, with some top line in this circular quiver theory in 4D. Now, what I do is I put the theory on, on this product space, S1 times R2 times R. All right. But the important point is, well, I, uh, I twist the product between S1 and R2 so that when you go around the S1, then you, you glue R2 back but with angle epsilon, right? As you go around this one, the R2 is rotated by angle epsilon, okay? So that's what I mean by this twisted product. And now I wrap, I, I take this whistle top line, I wrap it around S1, all right? On R2, it has to be sitting at the origin, which is a fixed point of, of the, of the uh, of this rotation, in order to to preserve supersymmetry, and um, uh, on this R, it can be sitting at any point. Okay. Now I introduce this Wilson top line. Now what I want to do, uh, I go to Coulomb branch and I I want to compute the VEV of this Wilson top line. How do we do it? Well, it's in general it's very very difficult. But in, in, fortunately, someone else has have done that. So Ito, Okuda, and Taki have done this computation using SUSY localization techniques. And here's the result. All right? Uh, you notice that well, this depends on uh, various parameters. So you have A, you have B parameters. All right? A and B specify the uh, the boundary condition at infinity of this four dimensional space, space time, okay? Namely, A is the, uh, um, uh, it's basically specified the, the, by, by this a uh, Wilson line at infinity wrapping S1. B is the, the holonomy of the dual Wilson line of the uh, uh, dual Wilson line, or a magnetic dual of Wilson line. But anyway, so that specifies the boundary condition. If you specify A's and B's, then that specifies the boundary condition that specify the point we are considering on the column branch, okay? 
But anyway, so here's the formula for the fifth. Uh, and, this, sorry, can I ask a quick question? So this epsilon on level of geometry, how it transforms on um, reads on level of fields? Transforms on the level of field. Sorry, I, so you, you have fields which uh, here, yes. So, so uh, how, how trans um, how is this epsilon translates? Uh, I think you, you mean, right? Well, I, I mean, reads how, how it reads. Uh, for, for, what does it mean for fields? What does it mean for fields? fields which on such twisted uh, geometry. So, uh, I mean, you, you define this sphere theory on, on this space right and uh, and what, what what else do you, do you want to say i mean this epsilon will appear in the lagrangian right in the form of a it doesn't it, uh no it doesn't i mean lagrangian is just is just integral of La lagrangian density and i integrate it over this particular geometry you have like background the metric to enter into lagrangian right so through the metric it will enter yeah through the metric Sure. Yeah. That's what you mean. That's it. That's it. Okay. Mm. All right. Mm. Uh, or you can think of this S one as a compact fashion of an interval. All right. Period, and you you and epsilon specify the periodic boundary condition imposed on the field. Yeah, that's uh, that's what I saw. I saw that it is some right. list of boundary conditions probably. Okay, but anyway, so uh, so this is one way to compute the this VEV. and if you um, use AGT corresponds, then you can map this computation to computation in total theory on, on CFT side. Um, but either way, you get this result. But anyway, so you notice that this L, the same function appeared uh, here. This L M we actually encountered before. And you realize that, so now you, you want to compare the two results. So the result from gauge theory and this transform matrix of this particular trigonometric quantum integrable system. And they are pretty similar, all right? And what's the, what's the precise relation? The precise relation is the following. So in the VEV, uh, it uh, appeared these parameters A and B and actually there's a natural quantization of these parameters so that they satisfy this uh, commutational relation. And um, so you get some function on the phase space, which you, you can quantize by vial quantization. So then, quantizing that's already uh, some uh, expectation value of some in some quantum field theory. Why we quantize it once again? Why are we doing that? Why would we do that? You are asked, so uh, you, you want some deep answer, right? Well, um, not deep, but just like psychological even. <laughs> and like, why would you? You finish your calculation by computing a VEF and field theory. You, yeah, you well, it's actually, so you, you can think of these parameters A and B as specifying a, a boundary condition at infinity of this R2, right? Okay. But then uh, in order to go to uh, relate to, sorry. Uh, all right, intuitively, it, so you have this twisted product, right? And the effect of this twist is, is such that quantum, quantum effects tend to get localized to the fixed point of the rotation. Okay? It's just like omega deformation. So if you go to IR, you expect to get an effective dis description on the line, quantum mechanical dis description, right? So, so, you, you, so, uh, so you do get. Yeah. Expectation value is already contains epsilon as a parameter, right? It is, yes. Where is it actually? I don't see Sorry. it. Sorry, uh, expectation value uh, is contained. Yeah, uh, it, it's in here, actually. Oh, it's right. in the definition of function L. Yeah. But epsilon 
appears here as a Planck constant. Yeah, that's a bit weird. So it's like the, the, you already computed the scalars, but now you decide to yeah, but, make an uh, You get quantum mechanics here, right? So where does this quantum mechanics live? It well, actually what is classical mechanics. Let's begin from classical mechanics. Where is the classical mechanics? <laughs> Where is the classical I mechanics? I mean, if you have two numbers, two and three, you wouldn't say, okay, let's now make them non-commutative and introduce quantum mechanics. You just have A and B. There is no, no, well, you... there is no classical dynamics. Why, why would you start introducing quantization? I, I mean, so what this setup naturally gives in is a... Uh, quantum mechanics on this R in the infrared. And that's that's a quantum mechanics I I, I get. Maybe, uh, can I ask a related question? So if you go back to the matching that you have the correspondence, the two, mm -hmm. the transfer matrix, we know that has eigenstates and they correspond to some energy spectrum. So we know that if you diagonalize, you get some states. What are what would be the states, the eigenstates of the line above? What's the meaning of the eigenstates of the Wilson line vacuum expectation? State, yes, yeah, states would be something that right that so you want to in order to identify the the Hilbert space of spin chain here, you want to think of this as time, and consider a time slice. And the, and there you you get the Hilbert space. And I I want to view it. I want to identify it as at the end of the day Hilbert space of the of the corresponding spin chain. For A and B, uh, what are A and B? Is this are parameters of your theory, right? Initially. Uh, what what's which one? A and B. What what I A and B are parameters in in your theory. They're yes. not dynamical variables. No, so they specify boundary condition at the infinity of here. Right, so now you want to kind of let them evolve in some sense, right? And then yes. what you're finding is like classical version of the previous classical system. But I want yeah. to see like, how do we define uh, first, from first principle, how do we define dynamics? Say what is A is a function of T and B is a function of T. First, classically, let's uh, understand uh, this system as classical dynamical system and then quantize it, uh, okay? That's, that's, before quantizing, I, I, I prefer first have a good classical understanding. So what, uh, what is being dynamical? If A is dynamical, then how do I compute A as a function of T given initial conditions? I mean, you're... <laughs> You're asking what should be the Hamiltonian then of this quantum mechanics, right? Yeah, so I mean, you have transfer matrix, right? So we can say, okay, let's define Poisson bracket in, uh, in such a way that A and B are canonically conjugate. And then this transfer matrix matter. really is this guy. Okay, yeah. And then it uh, defines you some uh, dynamics of A and B. Now you say, okay, I'm not satisfied with that. I want to quantize it. I don't know why, but okay. No, well, you naturally, you really get directly get quantum thing. Well, so not if you just compute a uh, web in the theory, right? You need to do yeah, something. Because I'm, I'm considering, I'm taking a transform matrix and somehow con considering a web of that in that quantum mechanics. And that's why I get a number. Now, my question is, what is this quantum mechanics in terms of the initial theory? without just words that it's naturally attached to this theory. Like what is the formulation which is independent of the it's a, it's a quantum, quantum matrices and so it's on. It's a quantum mechanics on, on the, uh, uh, where Hilbert space is this time on the time slice and transfer and operators are, are these wisdom top lines. Right? And if you remember um, top line and wisdom line in, in this setup, they don't commute, right? Um, when um, when you have Wilson line at value t and top line at different value, and then they don't commute, okay? Um, when when you switch 
posi their positions on the timeline. And, and they actually, the difference is given by this epsilon in, in, this, in this system. So, so the algebra of, of line operators is quantized. Can we think, because you said that, so A and B specify your boundary conditions at infinity on R2, right? right. So can we think that you are sort of coupling your gauge theory with some theory living on some asymptotic boundary? I, well, that, that would change. That, that would be something further you want to you introduce further in addition to this setup. So A and B just specifies waves of some fields in, in this theory at the, at the asymptotic boundary of R2. Classically, when, uh, so why do you choose uh, the A and B as um, conjugated uh, variables in continuization? Because you have symplectic form in classical yeah. level, which- So, right. So, so you, if you start from this setup, right? Uh, S1 times R2 times R, then you can go to effective 3D theory on R2 times R, and uh, which I explained at the beginning um, when I talked about the quantization of Donaghy Witten integrable system, right? So you get three effective 3D n equals four sigma model whose target space is this M, which is, which I, as I explained is the, uh, the phase space of an integrable system. And that phase space has a natural Poisson bracket. I mean, symplectic form. Mm -hmm. And these are double coordinates. Okay, simple yeah. question. When you actually write Lagrangian on your twisted uh, manifold, uh, do fields commute, uh, or it's like non commutative uh, definition of Lagrangian? So, this uh, I mean, question just what Kole said that epsilon comes to the ground matrix. Is it true? Is it coming to the truth matrix, or it's coming to the fact that multiplication of fields is not commutative? Uh, well, what's coming? What's coming from? Epsilon, epsilon. So right. we get the So epsilon comes through the ground matrix. I'm asking maybe just the fact that actually it comes to non commutativity of fields in the ground. So, all right, when, if, when there's no epsilon, all right, you can place these half BPS line defect at any point on R2. It doesn't have to be sitting at the origin. Okay. And, and you, 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 still, you can still preserve supersymmetry. But then, if you have such uh, two, two line operators sitting at any point on R2 times R, then you can just switch their positions, right? Without having collision of line operators. Only when epsilon is non-zero, only in that case, these line operators have to be sitting at the origin fixed point of the rotation and when you try to de switch their positions on, on this time axis, then they have to collide at some point. All right. And so you, get, you get non commutativity. So, to translate you, if you have two T's and, and the expectation values, then uh, they wouldn't commute, right? Or they no, they, they don't. So, when, so, the general result is the following you have with some top lines L1, L2, L3, and so on, then compute the VET, then that's actually known to be equal to a Moyal product of variable of L1 and variable of L2 and variable of L3 and so on. So in other words, uh, this VF of T is kind of uh, uh, a matrix element of transfer matrix uh, on some kind of uh, non-diagonal non space uh, state right on so non-diagonal so it's not eigenstate it's like uh, oh, what is oh, it? Right, right. yeah but i i'm so but i'm going to so if you re restrict 
a class of uh, line operators yeah. and you can find coherent. usually computing. So it's like uh, T evaluated on some coherent quasi-classical state, right? And that's why you get something classically looking. But uh, if you actually mm -hmm. compute, so it is a matrix element of T between some weird uh, coherent type of uh, states, right? It's like in harmonic oscillation. Yes, right? yes, that's right. So if you have so, two T's, yeah. then non-commutativity is already there. You don't need to actually introduce anything. Right. Yeah. That's the conclusion. Yeah. So it's like just in this model, if you can take two T's, then they will behave according to the rules we established in the spin chain. Yes. This non-commutative A and B. And then when you mm -hmm. evaluate this web of some kind of coherent state, then B hat becomes a number, A hat becomes a number, and then... Yes, that's right, that's right. Yeah. Okay, so anyway, so this is a statement of the correspondence. So why is this useful? I mean, why we have to be happy about it? So for me, it's just uh, find, just finding the correspondence between A theory and quantum integrable systems is already a good thing. But practically, um, you can generalize this correspondence. So you can change this representation to actually, uh, so this is a vector wrap, but you can actually take define corresponding Wilson top line for any representation representation of SUN. So there are generalizations, okay, for general rep. But here, you can also generalize transform matrix, okay, by fusion procedure, by considering tensor product of uh, lines in, in you know, uh, of the L operators, and then you know uh, uh, projecting to to irreducible rep. This also generalizes. And then we expect that this corresponds holds for general rep representations. But why why that would be useful? So calculation in gauge theory. So this part is very very difficult for general rep. But, so, but for that, all you need to show uh, to make the, what you said as a trivial statement or equivalent to it's not, it's not, it's not. It has to be well. Ideally, uh, uh, someone uh, someone uh, go ahead and calculate this guy for general representation and then compare with. No, but you have this amazing formula already, which you showed that uh, web of t of several copies of t. Mm -hmm. Can be computed in terms of a uh, web of one T with uh, mm -hmm. star in between. Uh, right, probably that that's been known. So if you know this formula, you don't need to need uh, the to know integrability. You can construct uh, um, T in any representation just within the field theory. Because T in any representation, you can decompose into fundamentals, and for each fundamental, you know the web, just compute star product in between, done. Right? Uh, yeah, you mean, you mean this for using this formula? Yeah, because like T in any representation, I assume you can express it in terms of. No, so so the, the difficulty is, I think, the gate in the gate theory side. That doesn't really work because here I'm assuming T T's to be different. They assuming they are sitting at different points on R. And then you you may say that you want you can take the limit when T1, T2, and T3 all go to zero to the same value. But uh, um, but that's actually not the same as having L1, L2, and L3 sitting at the same. Time well, in integrability, you know, you have to do shift by plus minus epsilon to, to get yeah there. from integrability. So, so if I, you I guess similar construction should be in the field theory side. You don't need to send them to the same point. Yeah, to be epsilon. Yeah, but that, that's not known. Yeah, but you just need to prove the single formula and never refer to integrability and be happy, right? <laughs> Yeah, but in, in this theory, you have to say, to okay, like in integrability, maybe this epsilon have to be there. Yeah, I mean, if you can do it, I mean, if someone can do it, uh, I'll be very happy, but uh, it's not known. Okay. Yeah. 
And uh, this problem is due to something called monopole bubbling and seems to be very difficult to understand. But all you need is our operator, it seems, because our operator is what uh, produce your projection in field theory. What is analog of R? I have no idea. Oh, okay. I think maybe let, we can have the discussion at the end. If um, Do you think uh, you could try to um, tell us something about the last part in like... All right, so let, let me see. So... Um, the... We need to leave and then we can yeah. discuss it. Yeah. All right, so um, let me let me come back to brain realization after I summarize. Right. Um, so here's a summary. Okay. Uh, so we so what did I explain? So I explained that we con well we concept a class of wisdom top line in forty n equals to circular queer theories, and then we found that. The, they can be identified with transform matrices of some particular trigonometric quantum integral system. And that's useful for calculations. And uh, the part I didn't explain, didn't explain yet is that, but you can actually embed everything into string theory because uh, this theory has this, this class S construction, right? And class S construction has a well-known string theory realization. So you can put this system into string theory. And why is this useful? Once you put the system into string theory, you have string dualities available, all right? So T duality, S duality, and all that. You start applying those dualities, then you, are, you get all different kinds of brain setup. And each brain setup leads to some gauge theory setup. But because they are all dual, the same integrable system should be hidden behind them. And in one duality frame, you get necklace of Shashivili, an example of a beta gauge correspondence. In another case, you get 40 chunk lambs and so on. Okay, so that's why I, I, I'm actually most excited about this brain uh, thing set up. But anyway, um, so further directions, what, what can you, where can we go from here? So uh, the part I didn't explain, but from brain construction, it seems like if you lift this setup, line operator in 4D theory to 5D theory, self defects on 5D theory, then what happens to the integrability side is that trigonometric system gets lifted to elliptic system. So that's something uh, I expect to see and it would be wonderful if someone can do computations in the gauge theory side so that I can match that, the result to integrability side, okay? And you can, of course, consider variations of this setup. You can change uh, gauge, uh, gauge group, for example. I consider SUNs, but you can choose different gauge groups. And also one important thing is that this 5D circular equivalence theory it's no well, you can take it and you, you can take some limit of that. And that actually gives a definition of this mysterious 60 n equals two count zero theory. So this already seems to suggest that there's integrability be hidden behind uh, this 60 two count zero theory. So it would be interesting to see what we can say about this theory using the result from here. Okay, so that's. That's uh, the future directions, and that's the, the end of the slides. Okay. Thank you very much. So um, please uh, um, unmute yourself. Let's thank uh, the speaker for the very nice talk. Right, thank you. So uh, I've used two hours. Sorry for that. Yeah, no problem. Uh, are there questions? Yeah, I have, yeah, I have one question. Uh, so, uh, well, you say that when you have Wilson line, it is mm -hmm. uh, charged by uh, Wiesley algebra. Mm -hmm. uh, when you have electric charge. Uh, well, but uh, well, I read a little bit paper, so it seems it's not actually algebra, but it's a fine version. Like, uh, well, after all, you have RTT relation at the end, right? So RTT is not about the algebra, but the affinization. 
like example, uh, what example to convince what I'm saying, saying about? If you take a joint representation uh, of uh, a soul group, then you okay. cannot uh, attach this representation to this new line when you quantize it. You have a normally, you have to actually make a joint plus singlet. And uh, okay. a joint plus singlet is actually a representation of uh, a finely algebra, but not, which is, uh, but it's basically you cannot lift, uh, lift uh, a joint to a finely algebra. So, but that's not the question. The question is, uh, Mm -hmm. You say when you have magnetic charge, it is charge on the leg lens dual. Mm -hmm. But uh, I would ask, don't shouldn't be charge on the leg lens dual of a fine algebra? And the point that leg lens dual and the finalization doesn't commute. Um, so I don't, I didn't quite follow your reasoning that. Uh, okay, it so a fine. In, in, very short mm -hmm. version of question. So I would say I have to put head on top of G. Here. Okay. So uh, I would put head on top of G. Mm -hmm. And now the question to you, when I do hoofed lines, should I have to put head before L, L or after L? Okay. Uh, uh, for GLM doesn't matter, but for the algebra it matters. I have actually no idea how, about how to answer your question, but I when when I consider n equals to gauge theories, I mean physical gauge theories, the Li, well, the uh, it's just the uh, finite dimensional Lie algebra you have. Right? Yeah, Diva, it, it's not in the Chern Simons theory that he has the Wilson line. It's in the gauge theory. Ah, oh, that's a good point, actually. <laughs> right. Uh, so it's not Chern Simons, right? Okay. Yeah. Right. And other questions for uh, Junior? Okay, uh, if not, uh, let's thank uh, Junior again. Right. Right, thank you. Yeah, thanks a lot.